so quiet in here you'd think it was church or something. My goodness. I'd be glad when our church is full of shouts of joy and, and uh, just un uncontainable expressions of devotion because of the salvations and the healings and the blind seeing, the lame walking, deaf hearing. I truly believe those days are rapidly upon us. And this won't be a quiet place. Have you ever noticed family reunions are not normally quiet? And they're full of joy and happy and sharing and, and that's really the way church uh, is and shall be. And there's times, of course, where I remember a, a minister I really admire, he, he would talk about the early days and he said the presence of God would come so thick sometimes in those services that not even a baby would cry for an hour, you know. And that's before they had nurseries. It was just a little small church in one big room. And, you know, when babies don't cry for an hour, you know it's God anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, the, ti uh, the title we put on this morning's message is When You Have Done Your Worst. <laughs> when You Have Done Your Worst. Uh, probably none of you but me can relate with that. You know. The enemy's really good at showing you how bad you are and how much you miss it. And, but what's worse than that, then he usually goes on from there and tells you how, how God's done with you. And, you know, the Bible says that, that God is the God of hope. I think the devil is the God little g of despair. I really do. I think, I think one of his primary targets is hope. Because if he can destroy hope, Faith has nothing to give substance to, see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. So, and we're going to look at a little different verses, though, than we did this morning. Turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Still talking about Peter. And... Uh, <clears throat> it's, am it's amazing to me how as you mature... Uh, grow in the things of the Lord, how different books of the Bible become your favorite. <laughs> uh, for years and years and years, if I could only, I mean, if you were going to put me on a desert island and I could only have one book from the Bible, one, I can tell you right now, it would have been John. Give me the Gospel of John. If I can only have one, give me John, you know. But as times have, uh, have gone on, uh, there was a time when I would, probably would have said, give me the book of Ephesians. And I love the book of Ephesians and everything that he's shown us out of there. My favorite teacher is still Jesus, you know. Paul, probably second. But I'll tell you who's making a run now. And that's Peter. Because the reason we all love Peter, we can all identify with Peter. More of him showing, um, let's say it this way, he's, he, uh, Peter becomes transparent. And we can relate with that. Peter was not perfect. God still loved him. God still used him. You know, even after, the, even after Peter was a tongue-talking, devil-casting-out <laughs> apostle to the Gentiles, you know, even after all of that, he still, he still, Paul had to rebuke Peter to his face. Remember that? And he didn't do it public. I mean, uh, privately. He did it publicly. So when I read the writings of Peter now, which we're probably not even going to have time to get into those tonight. See, it's Peter. <clears throat> well, we are too. Go ahead. Turn to Peter somewhere. I don't know where yet, but <laughs> where he says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Y'all help me. Is that first or second, Peter? That's, that's what I thought. <laughs> uh, here it is. Yeah, it's first Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and uh, thank you, verse 6. We're going to, you know me though, we can't start there. <laughs> so back up to verse 1 of chapter 5. See, because, um, again, it's just amazing to me how the Holy Spirit weaves together the messages. I was listening to Doug this morning and how the, I mean, if I had one word for Doug, now he'll probably, slide. he's not here, is he? Good. He has to work tonight. A lot of nights, this, oh, he has to work. It's pure. It's pure.
pure, that one word, you know. And I, I'm learning a lot I didn't know about Doug, you know. And uh, but the, just that the way he presents it is so simple, you know. I can understand it. Thank God. <laughs> and he's talking about real submission. See, I, I've, I've told y'all before. Now, my 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 dad, O.R. Carpenter, my earthly dad, was, he was real good at making a. Uh, a, a he was training me up to run the business, which I did. But see, you can't be a person of authority until you first learn how to be under authority. A lot of people can't even keep a job because they can't, they can't follow the most simple instructions. They think they know better. They just think they know better and you shouldn't do it this way. And they don't, they don't have any idea what it means to submit to authority, see. Now, this is previews of coming attractions. There's a whole series that the Lord is birthing in me about Peter and submission and but <clears throat> which it's going to take some time, which we certainly can't get much into tonight. But when, when you understand where Peter is really coming from, these words of his, Peter learned how important it was to submit to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how much you love him, no matter how much you uh, are willing to... You know, what he, one thing he found, you know who it was that slung that, that you know, when they came to arrest Jesus... You remember who it was that had that had this the sword? It was Peter. Why? They were coming to arrest his master and, and kill him. Jesus had told him way earlier that that was going to happen. And you remember what Peter said? No. And later on, we'll get into. I mean, Jesus went to great lengths to straighten Peter out on that, and Peter never did get straightened out on it. Still yet was thinking no. Still yet was thinking no. I'll stop it myself. Well, this, this man, Peter, lay, over the course of a lifetime, he wrote these letters pretty late in his life after a lifetime of serving the Lord. Now notice, notice, notice what he learned here. This is so good. <clears throat> so, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Stop for a minute. John, I believe it's John 20, close to it there. Three times Jesus asked Peter. Now this was after, the, after Peter had denied the Lord, you know. And after Jesus is resurrected, three times he asked him, Do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Then what did Jesus say? Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. What is he? All these years later, I exhort the elders which are among you. Verse 2. Feed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, <laughs> but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. Don't do it for money. But of a ready mind neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples, which means examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. <laughs> now look at this next verse. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Now, you think he might be remembering a time when he was in his youth. <laughs> and there was an elder. His name was the Lord Jesus Christ. Not elder in age so much, but elder. And he says, you know, it'd be a good idea. You know, youth, you know, zeal without knowledge is not good. You remember that? It, you know, you might be, it might be a wise for you, young, younger. I was one of you once, full of zeal. I have some counsel for you. <laughs> You might want to submit to the elders. Yea, and all of you be subject one to another, and notice this, be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. That sounds like almost the opposite of what he was in the garden that day when they come to arrest Jesus. He was anything but humble, wasn't he? Jesus plainly told him, you know, by the way, I did make a mistake on this morning's message. I was, I was saying it was the Roman army that 
came to arrest him and someone politely and gently corrected me afterwards and said no no it was the it was the uh, elders of the priests and the people okay so we've already made a correction so I don't look like an idiot okay and you can take this apart off too Kyle off of this one <laughs> thank God I mean okay you think you're so perfect to get up there for a while okay all right get over yourself I keep telling you get over yourself all right? we all make mistakes but the point of it was true. I, I mean, Peter was ready to die right then, wasn't he? Physically. Now, see, it's amazing to me. Physically, he was... He, did you know that... You know what the lesson is from, from that? It is easier to fight for the Lord than it is to live for the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever think about that? It's easier to fight for the Lord than it is to live for the Lord. Humble yourself under whatever the Lord says. That's your life, see? Mm. Okay, that's really kind of a... That's a good message, but it's just not tonight's message. <laughs> All right. So look at verse 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, and all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. I had no earthly idea that Doug was going to minister out of that, that passage in the first service today. I just, it's just amazing. I just watched the hand of God. I just find it amazing, you know. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now look what Peter learned. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. There was at least two times in Peter's walk with the Lord where that was tested in his life. One was the time when Jesus told him, let's, let's go over to the other side. And the disciples all got in the boat and Jesus was asleep on a pillow in the hinder part. And as they're going across, a big, a great storm arose. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure they did everything they knew to do to make it through that storm. They, many of those men were fishermen and made their living on that sea their whole life. And so they were expert at it. I'm sure they did everything they knew to do, but still the, vo the boat was filling with water and it looked like they were going to die. And they wake Jesus up. And in the King James, it's a little blind because of the way it's worded, but it says, Carest thou not that we perish. In English today, how would we say that? Don't you care? Don't you care? Look, do you not see the cir No one's ever been there. God, do you not see the circumstances that I'm in? <laughs> Have you heard the doctor's report? Have you seen my finances? Have you seen the rebellion my kids are in? Have you... Don't you care? And what's amazing when I read that passage, you know, Jesus oftentimes would talk to him about little faith or what, you know, little this or that. He seldom says, how is it you have no faith? But he did there. When you get to the point where the devil beats you to the point where you don't even know or you're really doubting if God even cares about you. He calls that no faith at all. Peter was in that group. Peter was one of those. Don't you care? But near the end of his life, after a lifetime of serving the Lord, I'm he says, I learned some things. You ought to submit to the elders. You need to take some counsel from me. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the storms look like around you. I don't care how serious and this looks like the end. You need to cast your care upon him. Because I have learned something. He cares for you. God bless. Man, that's, I'm going, Mwah. thank you, Peter. That's something I've got to have as an anchor of my soul. See, when the circumstances are bad, you know, you, I mean, you got the, the evil report. It looks like your, it's all over. Your ship is going down. I always remember Jesus is in your boat. He's not worried. He's asleep on a pillow. <laughs> He's trusting God whether you are or not. <laughs> this storm shall cease in Jesus' name. <laughs> now he may want you to stand up and speak to it. Like he had to stand up and speak to it. But don't ever think he doesn't care. And don't ever think he doesn't have an answer. He does have an answer. Amen. Oh, God, that's good. I'm preaching good now. Glory to God. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Yes, sir. Now, right at this point, put a marker there. Yes, sir. 
and go back to Matthew now. <coughs> and <coughs> pick it up in verse 69. Now this is during the, uh, the arrest and the mock trial of, of Jesus. We're going to pick it up in the middle of all that. Verse 69, we want to look at Peter here. <coughs> it says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came, came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. She'd, she'd seen them together. She, cause the cruc the, the, I mean, the, the, if you back up just a little bit, uh, look what they're doing to Jesus here. But look at verse 64. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. What think you? They answered and said, He's guilty of death. Then they did spit in his face, and they buffeted him. And That means they hit him. And others smote him with the palm of their hand, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? I mean, this is terrible what's going on. And Peter, he stood without. He's standing around a little fire, I think, out around the the palace and a, a young a damsel a young lady came unto him saying thou also was with Jesus of Galilee you're one of them you're one of his followers but he denied before them all saying I not know I, do, <laughs> I know not what thou sayest it sounds almost like Yoda in anyway I know not <laughs> what thou sayest I know not anyway and when he was gone out into the porch Another, not even the same one, another young lady saw him and said unto them that was there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied, now notice, with an oath. Now publicly, Jesus, publicly, Peter is saying, I do not know the man. He is denying that he even knows Jesus. And he did it publicly. Whew. Mm. Verse 73, And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. And another translation says his accent. They could tell that he was a Galilean. Then began he to curse Peter. <laughs> he begins to curse and to swear. <laughs> probably better that we don't know the actual words <laughs> but I mean he's cursing and swearing I know not the man let's say it a little different I don't know Jesus I deny that I know him I deny that I am a follower of his isn't that what he's doing and immediately the cock crew and Peter remembered the word of Jesus which said unto him, before the, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out, and he wept bitterly, bitterly, bitter tears. I can't imagine. I try, I've tried to meditate this because we're not told a whole lot about Peter over the next 24 to 48 hours. I've tried to put myself in his shoes, you know. Denied the Lord. Did it publicly. After everything he's done for me, after everything I've seen of them raising the, raising the dead and opening blind eyes, I walked on the water. See, this is Peter. He says, he spoke, and I stepped, and I walked on the water. How could I, of, of all the disciples, how could I be the one that denies him? You know the enemy had to be coming. You know the enemy had to be beating his brains out. It's over for you. You might as well go to the same field where Judas went. I don't you'll know yet if Judas had done that or not. But, you know, I mean, this, you might as well go hang yourself. It's over. God's done with you. Washed his hands of you. It's over. Then I read this morning that verse. It's Mark, isn't it? Mark, go to Mark 16. God, I love this. Mark 16, 
We're going to look at it again. I thought we was going somewhere else tonight, but that's what I get for thinking. I just work here. Wasn't that great to hear Pastor Dave and see Pastor Dave this morning? Was that great about red and everything that happened there? Let's not try and be anybody else. Let's, let's let the Lord make a snowflake out of us to, as, you know, that doesn't look like anybody. There is no other Dave. Trust me, there is no other red. There is no other red. I can't be red. I can't be Dave. There is no other Gary. Thank God. We would worship God right now. Thank God there's only one. <laughs> no, but I, I, I need him to make me to be the snowflake. I need, I, what I mean, not flaky now. <laughs> but I need him to make me what he intends for me to be. See, and you need to let him make you what he intends you to be. And maybe we can get this job done, you know. But anyway, I, have, I really have. I'm trying to put myself in Peter's shoes and the, the depth to which he must have, his emotions and his hope had to be just about gone. I mean, if anybody in the Gospels, their hope had to be destroyed, I would think it would be Peter at that point. I mean, that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad to deny that you even know the man and do it publicly, you know. So picking it up here, though, see, here we have a great insight to the heart of Jesus. Remember those verses I read, there is a friend. That sticks closer than a brother. And a brother is born for adversity, you know. And that's your friend, Jesus. Now, we can see what was on his heart really towards Peter right here. Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had, brought sweet, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Well, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone, it was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were afraid, <laughs> affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Now here it is. But go your way. Tell his disciples and somebody else. And Peter. The heart of the Lord. He was not done with Peter. He was not through with him at his darkest hour. When Peter had done his worst, he said, you be sure and tell the disciples and Peter this good news that I have risen. Glory to God. He wasn't done with Peter. He's not done with you. Not on your darkest day. Not on your worst day. I don't care what you've done in your past. And by past, I mean five minutes before you got to this service. <laughs> Or five years ago or ten years ago, get over yourself. Get over Peter had to get over it or God never could have used him. Peter had to get over the embarrassment later on after this event, years after this event, when after Paul publicly had to rebuke him again. He had to get over himself again and let the Lord use him. No wonder Peter would write, humble yourself. It takes humility. You've got to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time hmm. tell the disciples and Peter that he goeth before you now still trying to use Saul's armor here Let's see if I can do this I've got my for those of you can't see me I got my iPad ah I think it's going to work now this is something that's in the face to face documents that the Lord said to me quite a few years ago I don't know that I've ever denied the Lord the same way that Peter has. But I, I, I grew up in church. I knew who the Lord was from a very young man. And, but by, by, and my, my parents were the good kind. You know, the kind that knuckle you in the head and make you go to church whether you want to go or not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I like how Dave says that. You knuckle you in the head. We're going. It's Wednesday. We're going. Okay. But as soon as I got old enough where I had a car and discovered girls... <laughs> And they couldn't really make me go anymore. I didn't go anymore. And uh, boy, I really got out there. I, 
I was a prodigal deluxe for many years, from about from a teenager till age 33. I know what it is to be a prodigal, and it's not it's not good. It's not good. Well, then, like God sends Michael Muccio, and you've heard that story, and and got me back. And I wish I could tell you that my climb has been uniformly <laughs> up, that I've never fallen or I've never made bad mistakes and. And, uh, okay, let's use that horrible word. I've never sinned real bad, you know. But I have. Now, I never backslid back into the world. I've never, that, you know, not this. Now, if, if I had, would he be done with me? No. I'm just giving you my testimony. But I've, I've, I've backslid. I've fallen out of prayer for a day or two. <laughs> uh, maybe longer, maybe a little longer. And you get to feeling like a sheep-eating dog, you know. You get to feeling so... Maybe not, as, maybe not quite to the depth that Peter was. But listen to what he said to me. This is in the face-to-face -face thing. I had never heard this before. But he said to me then, he said, Think, oh, this is the Holy Spirit. He says, Think not religiously that I am only with you when your performance meets certain standards. I have been with you in your finest hour. I have been with you in your worst. I have been sent to abide with you forever the blood is continually available for you it never loses its power to cleanse the blood will never fail you the blood will never lose its power to cleanse you and to keep you in fellowship with me says the spirit of grace I am the friend who has seen you at your worst yet I still love you he says, I cannot be shocked. I cannot be surprised. Do you ever think about that? He can't be surprised. Is the Holy Spirit God? Isn't he God as much as God the Father, God the Son? Does that mean he knows the end from the beginning? He's not shocked when he sees your failings then, is he? I've never thought about that. Until he said it that way. I cannot be surprised. He says, I can be pleased. And I can be grieved. But my fellowship with you is not so fragile that I would break off that fellowship when I see your failings. You have earthly friends who love you more than that. Think you not that I love you more than those. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? But now, see, this radical grace thing that has gone along takes those truths, which they're very true, and twists it to say, well, see, you're so saved, you're so cleansed that when you sin, you don't even have to confess your sin. Like it's all automatic. Like that, the blood is a giant washing machine that's always going and, and it's just continually cleansing you whether, you know, whether you uh, repent or not. That is absolutely not true. If you don't believe that, ask the prodigal. <laughs> God says, this my son who was dead. He was dead, not just lost, dead. And is restored, see. No, you no, when you yes, sir. First John one nine, let's go ahead and go there. You're not going to take first John one nine away from me. You can try all you want. I'm keeping it. <laughs> see he's rather Right. We, 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 by the way, we had a at the conference this time I, I met a new friend that he's been listening for a while. And um um, I think there's going to be a fellowship established now over the years. He lives in another state, but he, he was a he was caught up. Pre, he was a preacher in the radical that radical grace thing for 15 years. I mean, this guy has a has experience with it. He must have been in there on the ground floor when it first started becoming popular. And he says, I, I've taught that and preached that. And he said, but I, over a period of time, I began to see that there was a. I knew there was problems, but I couldn't quite articulate it, you know. And he says. He says, I got a hold of your teachings, Gary. When you started teaching that about the radical grace, somebody shared it with me, and you gave voice, you gave words to the truths that were already happening in my heart. And he says, I'm out of it now, and I'm teaching the truth. Say, so yeah, I'm out, out of it. He says, I can tell you from 15 years of experience, that message does not produce God-loving disciples. Amen. Thank God for the... I thank God for this little slopity floored church. 
I thank God for the truth that comes out of this place. It doesn't matter whether we have the chandeliers and the fancy whatevers, although a Starbucks machine would be good. But anyway, <laughs> I'm te teasing a little bit. <laughs> but I thank God for the truth. And it's reaching far beyond the four walls of this building. Amen. See, 1 John 1, 9, when I, when I, the Lord gave me the assignment years ago of studying, and I, I'm not going to get off really on the radical grace thing too much here. But uh, as I was, the Lord told me, he said, I want you to read these books by these authors. I don't even want to read them. But I, I, he, was, he gave, was giving me an assignment that I had to do. And as I was reading the books, now they've got some good, don't, you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I'm going to tell you, probably 90% of what they teach is pretty good. And they've got some really good insight on grace. I'm not really recommending you go get their books, but I'm just saying they've got some good insight. But boy, that other 10% is deadly. And as I was reading it, I'm going, I thank God. I mean, it's so slick how they present it. I, I was going, man, I thank God for every hour of prayer I've ever had, for every revelation Dave has ever taught me. I mean, this is pretty deceptive. I could get off in this. But I remember having this thought as I'm reading chapter after chapter. I said, boy, this guy is going to have a real problem with 1 John 1, 9. Because the way he was presenting grace is like, well, you're so forgiven, you never have to ever repent or even ask forgiveness or anything. And I'm going, boy, he's going to have a problem. Well, I thought he would probably ignore it. But he didn't. About four chapters later, he, he talks about 1 John 1, 9. You know what they say about that? You probably do because you heard me teach it before. <laughs> you know what they say? The only way they can square it with their doctrine, they'll say, well, chapter 1 of 1 John is not written to Christians. That's Yeah. That's written to unbelievers. And you know how they... <laughs> yeah, so some of his mouth was like... <laughs> You know how they justify it? Let me show you something. Look how, look how chapter 2 starts. The first words in chapter 2. My little children. See, that's where John begins talking to his children, the ones that are born again. Chapter 1 is to the unbeliever. Now, if you have studied Dave's teachings on the laws of meditation, you know, keeping everything in context and assimilating 1 John, a statement like what that guy is saying is the word asinine too strong? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's absolutely asinine. It, it, you, you, the, the rest of the chapters make no sense without the first chapter. No, the entire letter is to the Christian. It's absolutely to the Christian. And look at, look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Now my question is, well, what if you don't confess them? He's not talking about when you got born again. Jesus paid for all of that. Everything you did as a son of Adam, everything you did before you got born again, Jesus paid for all of that. Thank God I don't have to go and remember every sin I've ever committed since I was age five. Because, like, who could anyway? Everything you did as a child of Adam is under the blood. But as a child of God, that blood is still there. It's still on the mercy seat. You want to stay in close fellowship with him? When you sin, don't run from that mercy seat. Run to it. Don't run from God. Run to God. And if you confess your sins, if you confess your sins, if you humble yourself, that's how it's tying in. I see it now. If you will humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, Come again. I did it again. Just like a child to a father. What does any parent want? Every parent, what do you want for your children? If, when, they, when they lie or sin or something, do we kick them to the curb? You're no longer a child of mine. Is that how it works? What does every parent want? Tell me the truth. <laughs> be honest. Don't lie to me about it. Fess up. Now, there may be a spanking involved. <laughs> there may be correction involved, what I'm saying, you know. But... Uh, you know, the, I, I need you to be honest and tell me the truth so we can walk together. That's what God wants. This, you're not in a religion, you're in a family. And thank God for that blood that is forever there to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, back to 1 Peter. <laughs> back to 1 Peter. I'm having a good time myself. I love this. Yes, sir. We're, God's saying to you now, I'm not pointing at anyone in particular, but <laughs> God's saying to each of us, I have seen you at your finest. I have seen you at your worst. 
and I still love you. With this message, he's saying, just like God was not through with Peter, his ministry was really just starting. It wasn't over. Just like God was not through with Peter, he is not through with you. And I don't care what you've done. What he wants is for you to run to the altar, run to the blood, be honest with him. And I mean if you've got to do it 20 times a day. When you're a smoker like I was, you're under constant, constant conviction. And I, I don't know how many times a day. 20 may not be enough. <laughs> well, when you're a real smoker, you only light one a day. <laughs> I, I, there's some real smokers here. They know what I mean by that. You light one, then the rest of the day, you light the rest of them off of that one. <laughs> That's me. I was, that was me for a long, long time. I chain smoke. I've been sitting there working those plans at night, trying to estimate jobs, and I, we had a big round ashtray, big as a dinner plate, big old round ashtray there, silver. I mean, I'd look over there, I'd have three of them going at once. I'd be, you know, so caught up in it. I'm mean, smoking. You holy, holy Pentecostals look at me like, what's wrong with you? Well, we'll talk about your stuff next week. <laughs> but when you're that, you're like that, and you're you. you and you've tried, you know, I was trying the nicotine, I was trying all the patches, I was doing everything. And I just, at the stronghold, I couldn't get past it thin. Thank God for Pastor Dave. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for a shepherd who just, he, that's in the, in the days when that phrase, I should have nailed it over the door of my house. Better is a creep that prays than a creep that doesn't pray. <laughs> just, you might as well go ahead and pray. Run to the blood. I don't care if you've got to go 20 times a day. Run to it. Confess it again. Say, I don't, I'd read Romans 6. How can you continue in sin? And I'd go, I don't know. But I am. <laughs> but I couldn't start justifying it and saying it wasn't sin when I knew it was. And I couldn't start saying God's okay with it. He's not okay with it. I mean, He loves me. He's there to help me. He's my friend in the middle of it trying to get me out of it. But He's not the father of my flesh. He still had a message for me. Gary, go put your flesh on the cross. And I'm going, I'm trying. Puff, puff. <laughs> it won't stay there. <laughs> anyway, so why, you keep on. And you keep on. And you pray again the next day. You push away a little bit from the dinner plate the next week. You pray some more. You meditate some more. You confess some more. And then if you keep that up, one of these days, you're going to have an encounter. Something will happen. Something will happen. You'll, you'll step out of one room into a room you've never been before and your liberty is in that room and it's over it's finally over and it's been over for over a decade now I look back there now and I, I thought how in the world could I have been like that well I was you know I was but boy you, there is such a thing as freedom we go through some we've been through some pretty stressful things since then well I remember the early days you know I mean before I was free the slightest little anything it may rain I need a cigarette <laughs> I mean, what I mean, the slightest little pressure, oh, I need a cigarette, you know, all the time, you know. It's Thursday, I need a cigarette. I mean, it didn't take much. <laughs> now, we can go through some pretty, pretty severe stuff, you know. And then eventually we're on the other side of that, and it'll dawn on me. Huh? I never even once thought about one. There is such a thing as real freedom. I mean, for a long time, it's resistance hoping for freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you that's ever been addicted to anything, you know what I'm talking about. But there is a, there is a place where even your old body can get trained. My body don't want... You know, my body fought me the first time I tried to smoke. It fought me like a... It says, are you crazy? I mean, I was about to throw up. And I forced it. I was going to show it's who's boss. My sin nature was boss. <laughs> okay, that's enough about me. Right? Back, to, back to First Peter here. But, see, no matter what it is, smoking is an easy thing to talk about, but no matter what it is, there's a lot worse things than that. He still says, Peter, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. How I did that then, I said, I don't know how to get free. I don't know. I know what the word says. I'm not denying that. How did I really cast the care? I went back to praying in other tongues, to be honest with you. I said, the Holy Spirit, that's where that phrase came from. The Holy Spirit is smarter than I am dumb. I don't know why I'm so dumb that I can't quit these things. But I know the Holy Spirit is smarter than that. If, he'll, if he will pray through me, even with these nicotine-stained fingers, 
I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to pray. If he'll pray for me, I'm going to let him. And for me, that was casting my care upon him. Somehow, I, I, I trust that this is really working. I trust that what Dave has said is the truth. I trust that you're making intercession for me. I trust that one day I'm going to be past this. And sure enough, I was. See? So, be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Now, he isn't a lion. But he, as a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now the question that Dave would ask. In context. Leaving it in the context. Who is it that's devourable? It's the one that never learns to cast their care. It's the one that never learns how to do that. It's the ones that. Uh, he's done with me. He's finished with me. I've, I've, I can't even pray anymore. I, the Holy Spirit won't pray for me. Just whatever, whatever, whatever. And you quit. That's the ones that gets devoured. No, no, no. Right at your worst. Right no matter what it is you're going through. You cast the hold of your care on him. One way to do that is pray in other tongues. Trust that the Holy Spirit knows about this more than you know about it. Trust that he knows you better than you know you. Trust that even while you're praying, he is making perfect enter. You talk about a friend sticking closer than a brother. The one that's in the foxhole with you. I mean, he's in the foxhole with you against a common enemy. If you let him, he will get you to the other side. In victory. In Jesus' name. I don't care what it is. Mm. It's good preaching, Brother Gary. Keep it up. I think I will. Hallelujah. <laughs> resist steadfast in the faith. How do you resist him? Cast the care. Now, about here, and we only got three or four minutes. About here is where Dave normally puts in the Ferrari thing. You remember the Ferrari? We'll probably close with this. Casting your care is not a one-time event. I have been to all kinds of services like that. Oh, you know, they'll preach like I preach, and then we're going to have an altar call. You need to come to the altar and cast your care. Lay your cares at the feet of Jesus, and don't take them home with you. I have been in so many of those services in my, my earlier days. And sure enough, you go. Dave has to. Dave says, I would go. And with all that's in me, I would leave my cares on the altar of that church. Trouble is driving home, I'd be driving a Volkswagen. My cares would be driving a Ferrari. <laughs> I'd open the front door and walk in, and there's my cares all waiting for me at home, and they'd lip upon my body. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I remember Kenneth Hagin years ago talking about he was trying to learn, you know, uh, cast the whole of your care upon the Lord. And don't be, be not, uh, don't worry about anything. You know, don't, uh, uh, verses like that. And he, he would say, Lord, I can't do this. I was raised by champion warriors to be a champion warrior. I may remember him saying, <laughs> he's, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. But the Lord wouldn't let him off the hook. He says, no, no, you've got to learn how to cast your care. So he said, I'd do it. And I'd kneel beside my bed and... Getting ready to get into bed. And I, Lord, I'm casting all my cares on you. And I don't know what all he said, you know, but whatever. I, the bills, they're in you, you know, I cast them on you. My health, they're upon you. My kids, they're on you. I don't know what he said exactly. Get in bed. Wouldn't be, wouldn't, you know, hardly get his eyes shut. Have to get out of bed again. <laughs> the cares, he catch himself worrying still. And he said it took, it took a while to train himself. To where when he really cast it on the Lord. See, Dave, if you want to know the truth of it, his, his message, the place called done, when you finally get to where you can do that, you have cast the care. You've really put it over into the Lord's camp. You're not taking the care of it back anymore. <laughs> You've cast it upon the Lord. And at that point, you're undevourable. The enemy... He can roar all he wants to. And that peace that passes all understanding is there. No, 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 no. no. We finally got to that place when our, when our daughters were all three in rebellion during those years. And our verse, the anchor for our soul, that's, if somebody needs to hear this, I, turn to Isaiah. This will be my last verse, I think. Tonight. I think. 49. Verses 24 and 25. Yes, there it is. 
because had the enemy was defeating me, all, all three of our daughters, we, we raised them to know the Lord. They had a lot of scripture in them. They, they knew better. But when they got, they were all three t teenagers at the same time. And I always say, I always pray for anybody that has three teenagers at the same time. But they all three went into rebellion and it was pretty serious stuff. I'm not going to reteach that tonight. But it, I mean, man, I catch myself waking up with nightmares and thinking about, man, so they're going to get raped, they're going to get killed, they're going to get this, because I knew where they were and the things they were doing. Well, a lot of, I thought I knew. Had I really known? <laughs> Stuff I found out later, oh dear God, it was way worse than I even thought it was, see? And how the enemy kept defeating my mind was, they know better than this. They're doing this on purpose. I have a right to them. I have lawfully got them because they're giving me that right. And I did not know how to get around that. So, you know, that, the enemy was defeating me. Thank God for praying in other tongues. Thank God that he can bring verses to you. He got us somehow, I don't remember how, but he got us to this passage in Isaiah 49, verses 24 and 25. Shall the prey, P-R-E-Y, be taken from the mighty, now notice, or the lawful captive? delivered. Now that's the question. The enemy kept saying my children, my daughters were lawful captives because they knew better. Yet they were rebelling anyway and he, said, he was saying I have a right to them. I, I, I have a legal right. They know better. And I, So the question was can the lawful captive be delivered? I'm, that's my question. <laughs> Look at verse 25. Thus saith the Lord even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered for I will contend with him that contendeth with thee and I will save thy children God we had an anchor for our soul I mean that's what I would we I wish I had a record I don't know it wouldn't be hundreds it would be thousands of times that Sue and I would walk the floor confess those verses over our children he will contend our, our God is contending with you devil that's contending with us God will save our children I don't care if they are lawful captives I don't care how mighty these devils are that you sent even the lawful captive shall be delivered the prey of the terrible shall be delivered God will save our children We'd walk the floor. We'd say it. We got to where even in our normal conversation, if you'd, people that knew us during that time, and, and they, well, how's, how's Aaron doing? How's Angie doing? Our, we'd so filled ourselves with the word of God. Our daughters are the handmaidens of the Lord. They prophesy. They cast out devils. They serve Jesus with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, how long did you want to stand there? That's how long we'd keep giving you scripture. And it would have been so easy to say, I'm so worried, I don't know what's going to happen. I know they're in the bars and they're doing all that stuff. That would have helped a lot. <laughs> no. But eventually, I'm telling you, I remember. It was done. We got to that place that Dave calls done. They were really over in his, his hands. And we knew it. We knew it. Now, it took a long time, even from the time when everything turned. It took several years before it was all really over. All three of them, though, wound up okay. They wound up getting married. All three of them worked for years for us in the ministry. Became uh, good wives, good parents. Praise God. His word is true. I think we should take counsel from this elder named Peter. No matter what it's like, no matter how bad we've messed up, no matter what the circumstances look like, perhaps we really should cast all of our care. Maybe we should humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Cast the whole of our care on Him. He does care for us. Amen?